thank you for being here. This is based on joint work with uh, a bunch of colleagues, uh, Nick Kozniaskas and Jillian Kozlowski, who are uh, graduate students at NYU, Anna Orlik, who's at the Federal Reserve, and uh, Venki Venka Tesweron, <coughs> who's a Christian student. Okay, so uh, lots of models recently are exploring effects of tail risk, uncertainty shocks, risk shocks, higher order expectation or sentiment shocks, all kinds of shocks to beliefs. Um, and we want to ask, where do these things come from? So before I go any further, let me sort of define some of the objects I'm going to talk about. So I'll talk about tail risk. What's the probability that some outcome, if you want, think about GDP growth, but any stochastic process, any macro variable, is less than some, uh, some level alpha that's far below the mean. So probability of some extreme event. That's what I mean by tail risk. Uncertainty, or we'll call this macro uncertainty, is what's the standard deviation of your forecast or your forecast error? How far do you think your forecast is likely to be from the truth? So uncertainty is a conditional standard deviation. What does that mean? It's the square root of the difference between this is the true realization of what that variable is going to be. That's your expectation or your forecast. A forecast is a conditional expectation. What's the gap between those two things? That's a forecast error. So square that forecast error and take its expectation. So how far you think your forecast will be from the truth on average in a squared square root term, okay? So that's what we mean by macro uncertainty. How far off will my forecast be? But then some people, when they talk about uncertainty, they mean something else. They mean micro uncertainty. And they're really talking about dispersion. And they're asking like some firm specific outcome. Maybe this is the output of a, of a firm I. And how far is that firm from the average firm firm's output yt. And so they're saying maybe firms get heterogeneous shocks and the dispersion of those shocks go up and so we have more micro uncertainty. So these people are also using uncertainty to talk about their shocks, but conceptually these are really distinct, right? I could do much better at forecasting macro aggregates, but we could still have really big heterogeneity across firms and these two types of uncertainties could potentially be completely unrelated. And lastly, higher order uncertainty, or this is kind of the basis of theories of sentiment shocks. Uh, they're about how uncertain am I about what you believe? Or put differently, how, what's your expectation and how far is that from the average expectation? So how different are our beliefs? How different are our expectations about future outcomes? And again, conceptually distinct. We're using uncertainty for a lot of different terms in this literature, but we could have very little disagreement and have very low higher order uncertainty because all of the data in the world is public, but we could be really uncertain about what tomorrow's outcome is and firms could be really different, right? So we could have any combinations of these things. Um, but I'll, I'll show you that in, they, they do tend to move together. There's a reason we're putting one, one word on all of these things because we do see times of high uncertainty in all these different senses and times of low uncertainty, they co-move, but it's a little bit puzzling why. Okay, so. For all of these, they're kind of two possible sources of shocks. We're all of these are talking about some, some conditional variance or some tail probability, and it could be that the actual variance of the data generating process changes, right? We could just see actual changes in the distributions of shocks we face. And that's what Gerardo Ludwigson and Eng and others are looking at. They're basically estimating stochastic volatility models and lots of macro data, and they say, well, there are about two large increases in macro variance. So we've seen two big uncertainty shocks. For tail risk, it's kind of hard to measure these changes. Other people have looked at this for cross-sectional firm dispersion. So surely some of that's going on. But there's another source of changes in uncertainty or tail risk um, that, that hasn't been explored as much. And that's that these, these are conditional variances. They're variances conditional on some data set. They're really about our beliefs. And they may change even if the true distributions are fixed. So a second source of changes in uncertainty is that maybe the conditional variance changes because our beliefs about the distribution change. So if we're going to pursue that logic, we have to address the question, why would our beliefs change if the true distribution was the same, right? That doesn't seem to make sense. It's a fixed object. Why would we believe something today and something different tomorrow? So we'll have to write down a theory of what it is that makes our beliefs change and how that <coughs> process works. So it must be that we don't know the distribution because if the distribution is fixed, we knew exactly what it was, and it's still fixed tomorrow. We wouldn't change our beliefs about it. So it must be we don't know what it is, and we're getting some new information, and we're updating. So we're going to explore this second possibility and think about how might learning, how might we write down models where people are changing their beliefs about a distribution, and that's causing fluctuations and uncertainty. So how do we learn about distributions? So I'm going to think about two, two, possible, uh, two possible ways we go about this. 
One is a Bayesian parametric approach. So maybe we're learning about parameters. I'm going to specify a functional form and we'll update about the parameters of that distribution. And the other is a classical econometrics non-parametric approach. Okay, so I'll illustrate these two ways of learning about distributions and how they affect uncertainty and tail risk and tell you a little bit about why that might matter for macroeconomics. So in both cases, we're going to use macro data and standard econometric tools to estimate a distribution. And then we're going to re-estimate it each period with new data. So I'm not taking in some exogenous shocks to uncertainty. I'm not having exogenous shocks to tail risk or to firm dispersion. All of this will come about by looking at actual macro data and feeding it into some learning model and having people compute beliefs, basically using standard econometrics tools. So we're going to think of agents in a model who are like econometricians. Okay, they're going to see some new data and they're going to estimate distributions the same way econometricians would and then take, make some choices, take some actions based on that. And we'll look at changes in the variance and tails of this distribution and how that could be a source of shocks. Okay, so I'm going to start with the Bayesian approach and then I'll do the, the classical frequentist approach. Okay, so if we're going to take a Bayesian approach, we have to take a stand on what distribution to estimate. You can't really get away from that. Um, so, one of the things I want to talk about is the importance of tail probabilities. So if I think tails are really important, I can't use a normal distribution. Because normals don't have anything interesting in the tails. The tails are too thin to drive anything, anything in, in any model that, okay. So no, no, un, no action in uncertainty if I use a normal model. So I've got to have some, some parameters that govern higher moments. And in particular, I'm going to look at skewness. Why skewness? There's nothing magical about it, but the normal has a mean and a variance. Let's go one moment further and think about slight deviations from a normal. Also, lots of our macro data has skewness. It's got asymmetry to it, like GDP, for example. We see much sharper downturns than we do increases. And I'll show you that it's going to be key for our forecast to look something like forecasting data. So, how do we put skewness in a low parameter model that we can actually work with tractably for Bayesian updating? Um, one simple way to do this is to take a linear hidden state model, basically a Kalman filter system, really easy to compute, and do a little twist of it. We're going to do an exponential twist. Why an exponential twist? Because it's easy to compute, because it has no additional parameters except for the ones we'll, we'll choose to add to govern that skewness. And it turns out this is used in the Bayesian statistics literature. It's a form of something called a G and H transformation. Uh, there are two new parameters, G and H, and they, they govern skewness and kurtosis. We're kind of shutting off the kurtosis parameter and using their, their G and H just for the G, the skewness. Okay, so here's the forecasting exercise. We're gonna take this two equation system, feed in US GDP data, and estimate it. And each period, we're going to feed in the next quarter of GDP data and re-estimate it. And the next quarter of GDP data and re-estimate it. And every time we re-estimate it, we're going to ask the question, how uncertain are people? How uncertain in the macro uncertainty sense? How far do I believe my forecast will be from the truth? Given that I know I don't know any of the parameters of the model, I'm going to take as given its structure but I don't know any of its parameters. I'm going to compute distributions of these parameters, conditional on all the data I've seen using Bayes' law. So we're just going to use Bayes' law to estimate this thing and compute uncertainty. So what do we get? OK, so first let me tell you, this is GDP growth. We've got a constant. There's a parameter that governs. This is our exponential twist, right? If I didn't have this exponential here, this thing would be linear. This would be linear. That would essentially be a common filtering system. Um, that's it. So we've got this one thing that makes it not quite normal, and that's going to be what gives it some skewness. So this is just an error one process. This is a hidden state. Here's my hidden state, and I'm putting the exponential twist around it. So now we're going to use our real-time GDP data, 1968 to 2013, from the Philly Fed. We're going to estimate it. We're going to begin with prior beliefs that are estimated on some training sample, 1947 to 68. Then starting in 68, and why 68? Because that's when our forecasting data starts. It's nice to compare this to forecasting data since we'll compute forecasts. Starting in 68, we'll observe each quarter of data one by one. We'll apply Bayes' law. We'll estimate C, B, sigma, rho, sigma, s. And then we'll ask our forecaster, how uncertain are you? Okay. So just using Bayes' law is a little bit 
uh, sweeping a lot of details under the rug. This is, this is a little more complicated than that. You've got to use a <coughs> Metropolis Hastings algorithm and a change of measure. We're working on programming this up as a particle filter. But basically, this is a way of giving you distributions of parameters conditional on the data you've seen. So the, the agent ju doesn't just say, well, here's what I think C is. They say, here's the mean of C, and here's the whole distribution of possible Cs given the data I've observed, right? And that's going to be an important source of uncertainty, the fact that I acknowledge I don't know C, and I don't know rho, and I don't know sigma, okay? So then we'll ask how large your uncertainty changes. So uncertainty again, conditional standard deviation of the outcome, given that I don't know what any of these parameters are. Okay, so this kind of encapsulates what, what, uh, what the model's about. I'm uncertain about the uncertainty of the economy. This, I am certain of. This is George Bush uh, parody just about the time of the financial crisis. And that's kind of what our agents are doing. They're uncertain about what the true variance is. They don't know the true uncertainty of the model. Um, and they're quite sure that they don't know what the true uncertainty of the, of the model is. And so we're, we've we're kind of got a model of George Bush. Okay. So here's how uncertain they are about that uncertainty. So this is the model I described to you. This is the blue line. So we've got big fluctuations in uncertainty. So it's normalized to zero. So don't, the units don't meet too much. They just mean percentage deviations from the mean. Um, but we see big fluctuations in uncertainty compared to what? Well, compared to the same model where I got rid of the exponential twist. That's the green line. People don't have much change in uncertainty if they use a normal model. And compared to a model where they know what the parameters are, we give them the full sample maximum likelihood estimates, put them down and say, there you go, there's the true parameters of the model. Yeah, they'll have some changes in conditional volatility because it's not a linear normal model, right? So we get some changes in variance based on the state space, but it's a lot less. So if I have a normal model with known parameters, that's got constant variance. We can just work out what it is, pen, pencil and paper, and uh, the variance of common filter system, it's got just one fixed solution. If we've got a skewed model and we know the parameters, we get some fluctuation and uncertainty. If we've got a normal model and we learn about the parameters, we'll update our beliefs about what the true variances are. But the combination of skewness and uncertain and learning about the parameters gives us a lot more action and uncertainty than either of these ingredients alone. So there's something about the combination, the interaction of those two ingredients that's going to generate large uncertainty shocks. And I'll try to explain to you what that mechanism is. Is yeah. there one parameter that is key? Like, is it really about learning about the variance? A lot, of, the mean, like a lot of it has to do with the, the parameter that, um, that governs the exponential transformation. So how, because you could be in a region of the exponential where there's not a lot of convexity, mm -hmm. and then it's almost like a linear transformation of a normal, and that would get you this green line. And so where on that exponential transformation <coughs> you are and how much convexity there is matters a lot. Yeah. Right, right. Um, I don't know. We don't have an infinite amount of data, right? I mean, to, 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 I mean, to converge exactly infinite time, right? I, I don't, I'm not sure what metric. I, I don't have a, a number for you. I don't know what, what metric you, you, you consider convergence and convergence enough. Um, th there is some learning here. There is some uh, amount of uncertainty that comes about through just getting to know the parameters. Um, one way to shut that down is a stochastic volatility model. In the paper, we, we look at that because then you have some change in parameters, so you never learn exactly what your state is, and it, it interferes with the learning problem enough to make, make that learning really slow. Um, but, yeah. Okay. So why are we getting big movements and uncertainty in this model? It has to do with what's going on in the tails. So that's why I'm talking about uncertainty shocks in a in a discussion about, in a, a talk about tail risk, because really all of this comes from what's going on in the tails. So what do I mean by tail risk here? It's a probability that GDP growth is less than negative 6.8%. Why that? Uh, it's an arbitrary threshold. It's, if this were a normally distributed series of data, if this were normally distributed data, that would be a one in 100 year event. That's how far it is from the mean. So let's take some, some threshold. We could use a different one. We'll get, we'll get something similar, as long as it's negative and far away from the mean. So if we plot that tail risk series, that's this black line, we get even bigger movements than the movements in uncertainty. Tail probabilities are going wild in this model, but it's very highly correlated with uncertainty. So the correlation between tail risk and uncertainty 
is 75%. So as a statistical matter, most of the changes in uncertainty are coming from changes in the tail. Okay, so now let's roll the question backwards. We know big changes in uncertainty in this model because they're movements in the tail. Why is the estimate of tail probabilities moving around so much? Okay, the reason is that extreme event probabilities are hard to learn about. Things that are hard to learn about, we revise our beliefs a lot in the face of new information. If it's easy to learn about, we figure it out, we converge, and we don't change our opinion very much. Stuff that's hard to learn about, we keep changing our mind because we're never really sure. That's the essence of this. So extreme event probabilities are really sensitive to small revisions in the skewness of the model. So let me just show you an example. So these are two distributions. They happen to be from two different points in time that our, our agents estimate uh, in the 1970s. This blue distribution has a skewness of negative 0.46. The green distribution has a skewness of negative 0.67. My guess is if I put these two things up and clicked through them sequentially, you'd say that looks like the same distribution. Right? They're really hard to distinguish, which tells us that statistically, distinguishing between this distribution and that distribution is kind of hard. Right? And the eyeball test kind of focuses in on this part of the distribution. That's where most of the data is. It's in this part of the distribution. Based on the data in that part of the distribution, it's not that easy to distinguish between these two distributions. And in fact, our agents sort of shift between them over time. Now let's zoom in. See here where it looks like it's zero? That's not exactly zero. Let's magnify that part of the graph out. Here's what the probabilities are. So they're really small. We're talking about probabilities less than 2%. Um, but the green and the blue look very different. So a small difference in skewness that's kind of hard to distinguish is wagging the tail of this distribution, right? The densities here are tiny, but the, de the difference in densities here, that green distribution with that more negative skewness, has a probability density of this extreme event that's double what the blue line is, what the blue density is, okay? So these little revisions in skewness that happen all the time are basically wagging the tail of the distribution around. And the reason they're causing such big revisions in the tail is because we don't have a lot of data to pin down that tail. We're using data from the middle of the distribution and extrapolating. And when we extrapolate, we extrapolate all the way out into the tail and it wags the tail around. And of course, what's, what's uncertainty? It's based on a variance. Variance is distance from the mean squared times a probability. These are really big distance from the mean events. So little changes in their probabilities mean big fluctuations in variance. Okay? So we can get big changes in uncertainty without any change in the true underlying distribution if we've got agents who learn about tail events because tails are hard to learn about. Yeah, Robert? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like a Okay, because Data that tells us about people's uh, expectations of the tails, for example, um, options prices, they do move around a lot. Financial products tell us that people have very different assessments of tail risk on different days. So here are two hypotheses. One is they're crazy. It's just you know, sentiment in the behavioral sense. Number two, they're actually learning some information that makes them revise their beliefs that way. If you believe one, I can't convince you otherwise you're lost, tune out. If you believe two, well, there must be something today that's relevant for those tails, right? And today is not a crisis. It's not a tail event. So there must be something about everyday events that we use to extrapolate out in the tails to make us change our beliefs, or we're crazy, right? So that's what makes me think that, that we ought to think about models where information in the center of the distribution is relevant for making assessments about the tails. Sure, I'd love to get there eventually. I, I don't have a really good asset pricing model to put on top of this at the moment, but yeah, that's, that's easier said than done. Uh, so yeah. Just, just, since you're looking at tail risk, why don't you also look at uh, kurtosis and control models? Yeah, sure, I mean, kurtosis in, in here is, I mean, it's not, you know, it's an excess kurtosis is not zero here. It is moving around. Um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to go a little bit beyond a normal and think about what the next moment is. But in principle, all the, all the higher moments matter for the tails and all of this stuff. I mean, I'm, do, I'm estimating complete distributions. We can compute any moment we want out of it. Yeah. So in Robert Barlow's work about rare disaster, mm -hmm. he 
basically claims that most of these like events that GDP growth went down like crazy, yep. they are related to things like wars and financial crisis and things like that, uh -huh. where they may be orthogonal to whatever drives like the middle of the distribution. So actually, uh -huh. literally in his models, he basically does like a two-part shock. Right. Does, like, the normal part and does, like, the right. part and they are not related. In so in case. his model, we would never get these out of the money puts to move around so much because normal events would be completely uninformative for the probability of rare events because they're governed by a different set of parameters. And given that today is a normal time, I get no new information about that stuff. So in, in your data, you find that the pricing of these options for rare disaster is correlated to what's happening with, like, prediction for GDP growth or something like that. Do you see a correlation? I, I, I haven't put all of that together. I'd need a good asset pricing model to okay, do that. Because but, there could be lots of movement there, but it could yeah. be completely correlated to what's happening. It could be, but there are lots of things going, you know, if you, you can see uh, SPF data and you can look at their most extreme forecasts, these things move, okay? Basically, Barrow doesn't have a theory of shocks to tail risk. He has a theory about how does tail risk matter for some stuff, for asset prices and macro and whatever, but he doesn't tell you why would the probability of that thing change over time and change a lot over time every day. That's what I want to give you. Why might tail risk change, right? And we, we can't go in and take data like they do about actual disasters and try to estimate this because, well, I, I mean, I don't see a disaster tomorrow. So if I didn't see a disaster tomorrow, why would I think the probability of a disaster is any higher or any lower than I did today? Um, except if I, I have a theory about changes in conditional beliefs. Okay, okay. Um, it would have to be generated by normal events though, right? I mean, they, there might be different sources. Maybe we could get into, you know, different outlets of the media that report these kinds of things versus, versus those kinds of things. But, but there's something that happens in normal times that seems to be informative about how, what we think the probability of a disaster is. That changes. Okay. So one of the things I mentioned at the beginning is I've been talking about macro uncertainty so, so far. How far are forecasts from the truth? But there are all these other kinds of uncertainties that people are calling uncertainties. We're kind of mixing them up and tail risk. And, okay, these things kind of move together. Okay, not exactly in lockstep. We've got macro uncertainty in blue, micro uncertainty, that's firm earnings dispersion, higher order uncertainty, that's the dispersion of professional forecasters. In fact, some people even use higher un order uncertainty as a proxy for macro uncertainty, because if we disagree, we must be really uncertain, right? Maybe, depends on your model. But these things move together a lot. And so we want to understand the next task is to understand why are these different kinds of uncertainties co-moving. So here's a little sketch of a model with, with some heterogeneity in it to explore this idea of dispersion and micro uncertainty and, and higher order belief uncertainty. So imagine an island model that's got a unit mass of islands and firms and they've got to make a decision. They're just a really simple decision. They're going to choose labor to maximize their utility. Utility is output, that's technology times their labor, minus the utility cost of labor. Okay, super simple production economy. What they don't know is what's technology. Okay? So technology follows a simple process, but it's got this non-normal structure. We're gonna put in that exponential twist again so that there's some tails in technology. Okay? And so firms are gonna forecast X and then choose labor. Okay? I'm gonna try to figure out what the hidden state is, and then I'm gonna figure out how hard to work on my island. Okay, how are they gonna do that? They've got a prior, which is to estimate the model on all the data they've seen through T minus one, and then they're gonna get some heterogeneous signals, right? Because now if we wanna talk about disagreement and dispersion, we need something that's different across these different islands. What's gonna be different across the different islands? They're gonna get different signals about the state, okay? True on average, but different realizations of some noise. Okay, and then we're gonna update with Bayes' law. Okay, paper with Nick and Anna has a lot more details about the model, but that's kind of the essentials of it. And so then we're going to calibrate it and we're going to get that all of these kinds of uncertainties co-vary. So they're all counter-cyclical and they co-vary with each other. So why is that? It's because they all fluctuate with tail risk. So let me show you why all these kinds of uncertainties could be related to the probability of tail events. Okay, so I want you to think about a non-normal distribution. Most non-normal distributions we could think of as functions of normal distributions, right? We can take a normal PDF. We can 
put some functional operator around and we can turn it into a non-normal. Okay? And that's useful because, well, then we can, we're used to thinking about normals. And so we can start to think about what the properties of skewed distributions are by thinking about them as nonlinear transformations of normal. Right? Linear transformations of normal are normal. Nonlinear transformations are not normal. And in particular, a concave transformation is going to give us a negatively skewed distribution. Right? Because it's going to take all these good states out here and make them just about the same in realization. So it's going to scrunch the right tail in. And it's going to take stuff that's bad and say, well, if the state gets a little worse, the outcome gets a lot worse. That's the steep part of this curve. So it's going to take the left tail and draw it out and make bad things really bad. Okay? So this concave transformation of a normal variable gives us a negatively skewed distribution. Okay. So now, how can we think about uncertainty? Let's think about a band on the, of the state space. Okay. Let's think of maybe that's a one standard deviation band. How uncertain are we about the outcomes? Well, if I think the state is in this interval, I project it up to my concave change of measure function, and I put it onto the outcome space, and the answer is, in good times, I'm not that uncertain about what the outcome will be. Because a lot of kind of different states, a lot of kind of different normal outcomes, would give me just about the same non-normal outcome, right? Because I'm taking the right tail of the distribution and squishing it. So I'm not that uncertain in good states. But in bad states, the same amount of uncertainty about a normal variable is going to give me a lot of uncertainty about what this outcome is. Basically, this is just trying to draw out the rate of Nikodym theorem, okay? which tells you how to think about what's the variance of a change of measure of a normal variable. Normal variable has the same conditional variance no matter where you are in the state space, but a concave function of a normal is going to give you a lot more uncertainty in bad times than in good times. Okay? So that's part in this model, that's part of what's making uncertainty move around, is that bad states, when we pull out the left tail of the distribution, get a lot more uncertain than good states are. Right? Normals have this property that no matter where the mean is, you've got the same variance. But most distributions don't have that property, and this one in particular doesn't. When things are bad, you're also really uncertain in this kind of world. Okay? So that's macro uncertainty. Now let's take the same logic and think about dispersion. Now instead of thinking about this as uncertainty, suppose this is our disagreement. Right? We got these heterogeneous signals about what the state is. So you got a good signal, I got a bad signal, so we're here. Well now, what's our difference in belief about what the observed outcome, about what TFP is? Well in good states, we could get really different signals but have very similar beliefs about what productivity is. In bad states, we also get different signals, and we end up with very different beliefs about what productivity is. So we're going to have a lot more disagreement. We're going to have a lot more higher order uncertainty here. My belief about what your belief is might be really off in bad states. But in good states, my belief about what your belief is, yeah, we, we more or less agree. And similarly, because we disagree, your production might be really different from my production. Your firm's earnings might be really different from my firm's earnings down here and they're going to be pretty similar up there. Yep. Why don't you just put one of the signals about the underlying state that's inside the exponential? Like, if you about the productivity, then you wouldn't have this um, Because I think... Suppose signals yeah. about the productivity, yeah, then I hear you wouldn't you. have this compared to just a linear. Yeah, um, but then you'd be getting normally distributed signals about a fundamentally non-normal process, right? A different way of saying this is we're kind of dis we're, we're making the distribution of signals have um, a shape that's similar to the underlying state. Okay? And I don't really have a good reason for thinking that the world is really skewed, but our signals have to be normal. It just depends what you think the signal is in practice. But what yeah, but it, even if I put it on the state, I still will get a little bit of dispersion because I'm more uncertain in bad times. So I'll put higher weight on the heterogeneous signal less weight on the homogeneous prior belief. I'll still get a little, but this, this amps it up a bit. Um, but in general, I think that when really bad things happen, people can have really different opinions about how bad it is. But when the economy is chugging along and everything's going well, there's not that much dispersion on what our forecasts are. And this is a model that matches that feature of the data. That turns out to be true. Dispersion is highly countercyclical, and this is a model that can match that degree of countercyclicality. Okay, so skewness, so the, which is that the curvature of this transformation is the skewness of the model, right? If this were linear, linear functions of normals are normal, we'd have a normal model, no skewness. 
The curvature of that change of measure function is the measure of skewness, is the measure of tail risk, right? The more negatively skewed this thing is, the bigger the tail risk. And that's what's generating this state dependence and uncertainty and state dependence and uncertainty. So skewness, which governs tail risk, also amplifies disagreement. And so firms choose different inputs, so then they have dispersion in their earnings or their growth rates. So that gets us micro uncertainty. They make different forecasts. That gets us high order uncertainty. So basically, changes in the tail of the distribution can make all of these kinds of uncertainties move together in lockstep. So it gives us some unifying framework to think about a lot of different kinds of belief shocks that people have stuck in, in macroeconomic models in different ways. Could yep. you also motivate it with like an exponential twist from mm -hmm. robust agents, like mm -hmm. from preferences? Yep, yep. So I, that's a good lead in. It also creates forecast bias, which is something we were talking about, about this morning. Um, so the mean GDP growth in our sample is 2.68%. As I point out to Yarda earlier, the mean forecast is 2.29%. It's about half a percent lower than the true growth rate. That's kind of wild. These are professional forecasters. These aren't like clueless households. And they're half a percent off on a variable that's only two and a half percent. That seems kind of crazy. And so most models of why forecasters behave that way say they're kind of crazy or they've got screwed up incentives. Um, but our model actually nails the forecast bias. We've got agents that, like robust control agents, have downward bias forecasts. And the reason is, OK, so, so there's actually, we can, we can prove this. Suppose that y is g of x, where g is concave, and x is normal, right? So that's what I've been talking about, concave transformation of a normal, negatively skewed variable. And we don't know the mean and variance of the normal, but we're, we have unbiased beliefs about them. So on average, the mean is right. On average, our variance is right, but we're just not sure what they are. Then the mean will always be greater than the forecast. Or put differently, forecasts are downward biased. How is yep. the forecast? Conditional expectation. Bayesian conditional expectation. Yeah, but the mean is a Bayesian conditional expectation as well. Ah, based on the true parameters. So by mean, I mean the conditional expectation given nature's understanding of the true mu and sigma. And by forecast, I mean conditional expectation based on some finite data set where we estimate mu and sigma. OK? There's, there's going to be a prior in there. Yes. Give them, the, give them the truth as a prior, if you want. That ties it. So we have unbiased beliefs. Beliefs that are true on average, but have any dispersion you want. Yeah, so I don't understand then how this is consistent with the law of the expectations. Trying to think of a quick way to prove that to you. Uh, let's come back. I'll work it out for you afterwards. OK? Both, both, both of those, if I should take enough expectations. But it's through a nonlinear operator. You can't run an expectation through a concave function. Nature's got the expectation inside the concave function. Forecaster has the expectation of mu and sigma outside the concave function. Why would the forecaster do that? It's just a gen because they don't know what the true mu and sigma are. They have to take integrals. OK, here's the forecast. Forecast is going to integrate over. Uh, yt plus 1, given uh, some density, uh, let's call it h of mu, let's write them, we've got some probability, joint probability distribution over mu and sigma, and then I've got to have d mu, I'm going to integrate over the mean, d sigma, and d yt plus 1 conditional on mu and sigma. Okay, that's a forecast. I don't know what mu is. I don't know what sigma is. I have to take expectations over them. Expectations yeah. means integrating. Yeah. Here's what the mean is. So here's nature's forecast. This is mu, the truth, mu bar, sigma bar. Okay, those two are not equal because this is not a normal variable. It's a nonlinear function of a normal variable. And so I can substitute, I can write this yt plus 1 is g of a normal PDF of x, that's the equivalent normal variable, minus mu over sigma. OK? And then I substitute that in here. And then, um, and then basically, it ends up being Jensen's inequality, that the 
that you're taking an expectation of some nonlinear function of random variables, mu and sigma, versus setting them to their mean. And the expected value is less than the mean because it's a concave function. Okay, that's the, I, I, that, that's as in as much detail as I can go in the shorter time, yeah. But, yeah. So do you see before the crisis 2008 more dispersion predictions? I mean, like, could one see, um, uh, yeah, yeah. one turn through the dispersion of beliefs? Because there were many different news, like in The Economist, they said, right. Spain will have a crash. Right, so at the China onset of the, uh, the financial crisis, yeah. we had very large dispersion in beliefs. Yeah. yeah. So Yeah, so some people have written about that, the forecast dispersion as a, a, a forecasting variable in financial markets. Uh, I, like uh, name is escaping me, but. 2001, the dot-com cri crisis, you right. saw something similar? Right, <coughs> yes, around turning points, there tends to be very high forecast dispersion. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, here's the, we've got a normally distributed variable with a true mean and variance. We're gonna take a concave function of that to get our negatively skewed distribution. Here's the mean of the normal. Okay, how do I get the mean of the variable? Well, I don't take the mean of the normal and project it up to, this would give me the median of y. I have to apply Jensen's inequality, which says when I take the expectation of a concave function of a random variable, the expectation is lower than the function of the mean, right? So the expected GDP growth is here. It's something less than the median. And by the way, the test for skewness, one of the most common tests, is, is the mean of the data less than the median. This kind of tells you why that would be true. When the forecaster tries to make a forecast, they don't know. This is the true distribution. Nature knows what that is. That's the true mean invariance. Forecaster doesn't know that that's the true distribution. Forecaster says, well, maybe it's here, maybe it's there, maybe it's there. This is the distribution over distributions. So the forecaster is a lot more uncertain than nature is because they don't know what the true distribution is. So when they compute their forecast, they say, well, let me take the expectation of a concave function of a normal variable, but a normal variable with a lot more dispersion. They've got a bigger Jensen inequality term in their forecast than does nature. So the point is that distributions with skewness or distributions of tail risk we can form Bayesian beliefs on them, and it looks a lot like ambiguity, and it looks a lot like robust control. Why? Because we're putting a nonlinear twist on the probabilities. They put the twist in preferences, we put them in probabilities, but it ends up having a very similar effect without having any non-standard or standard, we didn't have any preferences here. We just did Bayesian updating. What if you ask, oh. the, what yep. if you ask the forecaster for the median belief rather than the mean? Okay, so then, then we should get out something that's consistent. Well, I don't know. I mean, it depends what, what your model is and what you're using that forecast for. But we can explain why when they ask, you know, what is your best conditional estimate, your Bayesian estimate, that it should be systematically less than the data. Why? Because Bayesian estimators aren't unbiased. For non-normal variables, Bayesian estimators are not unbiased. They're just not. Yep. So does this result depend on the price? I said they've got unbiased beliefs. So that means that prior plus data, the mean of their beliefs is correct. It's the truth. The mean of the estimate of mu is correct. The mean of the estimate of sigma is correct. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what this is. So this isn't the data. That's the average data. This is the average forecast. In our model, that's the average forecast. So it looks a lot like the data. So forecasts are half a percent too low. But, but given the real life process of the data, it's the, I mean, it's, yeah. it still fixes the process of the data. Well, we're using real macro data. I, I haven't. But like if you use the prior and uh -huh. like, um, like redraw the data, like okay. you go to the unconditional distribution. Okay. But we can prove this. This is a lemma. This isn't true just for this data set. I mean, this data set tells me exactly how big the bias is, but. The, 
for any concave function of a normal variable, this is true. That's not every process, that's not every distribution, but for every concave function of a normal variable. Uh huh. You start from the prior over u and c. Yes. From that prior, you draw some u and c. Yes. And you go and draw GDP data given that. Yes. Take the mean on that GDP data. Yes. Is it, sorry, is it the That's mean? what this is doing, right? Here I'm saying whatever process you got me to, if I've got some beliefs that are not perfectly accurate on mu and sigma, however we got with whatever priors and whatever data, now we have those beliefs. Yes. Okay. If you take, so you've drawn the GDP data yep. along with the prior. You yep. take the unconditional expectation of you take the unconditional expectation of that including over the prior of mu and sigma. Including over the prior, the yeah. expectation over the prior. Okay, yeah. All the possible that, priors, yep. You compare that to a situation where you take the prior and uh, then look at the fork, then generate generate the data in the along uh, the same way that generates the forecasts. I think if you, if you integrate out, out over the same prior, uh, you should get a lot of iterated expectations. This is box econometrica 1971. Bayesian estimators are not unbiased for non-normal variables. They're just not. The law of iterated expectations doesn't hold. I, I, yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to get hung up on this point. I'll, let's let's come back to it afterwards. Okay, it's a it's a technical discussion for most of our audience. Okay, okay, that's Bayesian estimation. Beliefs fluctuate most for moments that are hard to learn. And in particular, those are tails. Tail risk generates uncertainty at many levels. It gives us macro uncertainty, disagreement, micro dispersion, forecast bias. All of these things are linked in this model. The next thing I want to ask is, OK, we just did belief formation. Can we embed this in a standard DSGE framework? So I'm going to lead you through a very rough sketch of how one might do that. The answer is the best way to do this, the simplest way to do this, is to step away from Bayesian estimation and to do non-parametric classical estimation. Okay, so here's a second approach to estimating beliefs. Instead of taking some stand on what the functional form and what the parameters are, we're going to do kernel density estimation. So let's take some IID shock, theta t, and it's got some unknown probability density function g. Okay, so this is any stochastic process you want. Our information set is some <coughs> finite history of those shock realizations. Okay, so you've seen a sequence of shocks. We're going to use a Gaussian kernel density estimator now to estimate beliefs. Okay, so this is not Bayesian, but it's if you open Bill Green's econometrics textbook, this and says, how do I estimate a distribution? This is kind of first thing that pops up. There are other ways to do this. There are the kernels you can use. There are kernels that give where you can deal with. It, we, in our experience, using different kernels for this application turns out not to matter so much. What does the kernel density estimator do? Okay, every time you see a new shock, it basically, this thing's a normal PDF. It says, let me take a little normal PDF and add it, right? We're going to take a sum. I'm going to add some probability density to some overall distribution uh, of all the data that I've seen. And you may say, isn't a sum of normals normal? Am I estimating a normal distribution? No. Sums of probability density functions, sums of exponential functions are not exponential functions. This will not give me a normal distribution in the end. That every data point I see, I'm going to add a little bit of probability mass at that point in the distribution. Okay, so that's 10 seconds on how a kernel density estimator works. Key property, though, what we're going to care about is it turns out that beliefs are almost martingales. Why? Because if I've seen, let's say, 20 years of data, and I'm about to see one quarter of data tomorrow. And I say to myself, what do I think this distribution will look like tomorrow? I better not think that it looks really different from today. Because if I think that tomorrow I'm going to have a much higher variance, well, then I should have put more variance on my distribution today. If I think that tomorrow that distribution is going to have a much lower mean, well, I should shift down my distribution today. So my beliefs about what the distribution tomorrow should be should look a lot like what my distribution today is. So that means that beliefs are martingales. That's a common property for beliefs. But martingales give us a lot of persistence, right? Because a martingale means any innovation in that process is a permanent innovation. If I've changed my belief from yesterday to today, 
that's a permanent change. That's a property of martingales. So think of like a random walk. That's a particular example of a martingale. So now we can use this mechanism. The fact that every time we learn these are permanent innovations to our beliefs, we can use to generate endogenous persistence in a business cycle model. And in particular, we could think about secular stagnation because at its essence, that's a question about persistence. Why was the shock that we saw in 2007, 08 so much more persistent in its effect on the macro economy than other business cycle shocks we've seen? And most of our models don't give us endogenous persistence. We get persistence in outcomes because we assume that they're persistent shocks and we feed those in, but the model itself doesn't give us much endogenous propagation. So here's a really simple way. Anybody can do this. This is not hard to do. This is one line in MATLAB. You take your data series, you type kernel KS, and MATLAB spits you out a nice kernel density, right? Any grad student can do this, and you can stick that in a DSGE model and start computing outcomes that are going to have a lot more persistence than what the series you feed in. So in this model, we're feeding in a shock with no persistence. It's IID, intentionally, so that all the persistence comes from the belief formation process. OK, so this is secular stagnation. That's US GDP data. Oop, there's the financial crisis. And we basically stayed below trend. That's what we're trying to explain. And some suggestive piece of evidence. Why do some recessions have persistent effects? Well, maybe because they cause us to reassess macro risk. So back to tail risk. We saw something really extreme in the Great Recession. We saw some outcomes we hadn't seen before. We saw things nobody thought was possible. If you asked somebody in 2005, do you think there'll be bank runs in the UK? They'd say, you're crazy, right? There's no way. And then it happened. And now we ask all the time, is the financial system stable? Is it still stable? Is it going to be stable in the future? And these are questions that are now in the forefront of our minds. So we saw stuff we didn't think we'd see and we reassessed the beliefs of how probable those are. That's what's happening in this model. So this thing's a tail risk index. So this is the SKU index, and it's constructed from out-of-the-money put options in the S&P 500. So this is produced by the same people that produce the VIX. Actually, have that's a volatility index. This is a skewness index. So we, this is just plotting their SKU index. Financial crisis, up it goes, and it's still high. It never came down. So tail risk climbed in the financial crisis and never came back down. OK, so here's an economic model. So kind of like Yardis' talk, we're going to take a new mechanism and embed it in an existing model, because everybody knows how the existing model works. It's published. We've beaten the heck out of it. And we just want to see what happens when we make our one little change. So our existing model is Gurio's AER paper. Yep. I don't know. Actually, I haven't looked at upside risk. This is a, this is a negative skew, so it doesn't tell me about about what the positive tail looks like. Um, OK, so some essential features of Francois Guriot's model of tail risk and business cycles. There's a representative household with Epstein's and preferences, consumption, labor bundle. There's a continuum of firms. They have Cobb Douglas production. That part's pretty standard. The key force, the driving shock in the model is this thing called a capital quality shock that basically takes your past capital and investment and converts it into effective capital. So we don't have technology shocks. Instead, we've got these things. Why put the shocks there? Partly because we're trying, or he's trying to speak to a bunch of financial market facts. Business cycle <coughs> models generally don't do a very good job of making returns to capital move around enough to make it look like anything in financial markets is happening. If you put the shock there, returns to capital move a whole lot. And so it does a better job of matching financial market features. But so this, I put this in red because this is the variable whose distribution our agents don't know. Francois says you know that. We're going to say you don't know that distribution. That's pretty much the only change we're going to make to his model. He assumes that the shocks he puts in are persistent. We're going to put in IID shocks, but we're going to get persistence because every time you change your beliefs about what that distribution is, that belief change is very persistent. If I, tomorrow I get some good news, basically what these guys are doing is every time they get a piece of data, they're dropping it in a histogram and drawing a smooth line over that histogram. That's what kernel density estimation is. Just think I drop a new piece of data in the histogram. Okay? But once I've seen that piece of data, it stays in my histogram. It stays in my data set forever. It never goes away. So the shock itself, its effect passes quickly. But the shock stays in my data set and continues to affect how I estimate beliefs forever after. Okay, that's where the persistence is coming from. Okay, 
There are also some idiosyncratic shocks to firms. That's just to get some of them to default and not others. There's some debt in here to make firms hold issue debt. You give it a tax advantage to make them not issue an infinite amount of debt. You give them a default cost. There's labor that's hired in advance. That's basically like paying your, your workers with debt obligations uh, before you observe shocks. Okay? So these things are basically in there to make the model more sensitive to changes in the tails. That's, what, that's the role those assumptions play. Okay? So we've got a standard production economy with some corporate finance twists that make output a little more sensitive to movements and tail probabilities than they would be otherwise. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip that. So here's what these capital, so we went to the data and just measured these capital quality shocks. So here's what they look like. They kind of bounce up and down, bounce up. we get a little dip in the late 80s, there's our financial crisis. That's the event we'd never seen before. They're actually two low pieces of data. It looks like it goes down for one period and then up. It's actually one, two, 08, 09, okay? So here's the probability, here's the kernel density estimator that I was describing to you. You take this data and you feed it in up until right there you feed it into that Gaussian kernel density estimator, and here's your estimated PDF. It's the blue line here. Okay? Now you take two more pieces of data, 08, 09, and you feed them into the kernel density estimator, and you replot that estimated density, and you get one, two. Those are the two additional pieces of probability density that you, you add after seeing the financial crisis. Now, those things are going to stay there for a long time. We're going to get more data, and we're going to keep dropping it in here, mostly in the middle, but those bumps are going to take a long time of no crisis for them to, to shrink down and, and to disappear. Yep. I'm just wondering, um, the fact that you use a kernel estimator uh, under an expanding window mm -hmm. means that every new observation is going to count less and less because of the That's right. fact that varies with the yep. sample size. So would you consider um, some kind of running window so we did an exercise where we did discounting of whole data. Um, I, I don't have, I, I didn't queue up the slides because I don't nearly have time to, to talk about it. It makes, it makes these effects larger because newer events have a, have a bigger kick. Um, but, but you could do a rolling window too. I mean, then you have to decide what the, what the threshold is and so forth. We just, we just discounted, tried 1% per year, tried 2% per year. Can I just yeah. in terms of persistence in that case? You would kill the persistence. Well, you won't kill it, but you'll, you'll diminish it, but very slowly over time. So in the paper, we, we have some results with, with discounting. And yes, eventually things disappear. It's not a true martingale anymore, but there's still a lot of persistence. Yes? So that mass should not be there since the 30s? Like why the right. so, is different? So the discounting is useful to talk about the Great Depression. Right? If we discount old data and we think that, well, maybe the world's changed a little since 1930. It makes sense to discount mm -hmm. normal observation No, we discount everything every year. Yeah, by, I'm just yep. saying that maybe it's not that rational to discount rate events. Okay, even if we don't discount it, it cuts the magnitude of the long run effects I'm going to show you by a third. Okay, that's it. It doesn't go away, but it cuts it by a third. Why? Because, yeah, you have one lump out here already, but adding two more still matters. Okay? Okay, so what we do, we calibrate the model, we feed in data through 2007. I'm going to normalize 07 outcomes to zero, and I'm going to see what happens when we add 08 and 09. You see how it changes beliefs, but I'll show you how it affects the macro outcomes. Then we'll take random draws from the 2009 distribution and show you what the average outcomes look like. Okay? So how does this ma matter for the economy? So here's the capital quality shock, one, two shocks from 08, 09. Then, okay, we're taking lots of random distributions, but that's the mean, okay? So that's the average distribution is that they go back to average. Okay, what happens to GDP? Blue lines the model, it falls, and it just stays there. That's our secular stagnation. We took a hit, and we didn't recover. Why not? Because the world changed, because our beliefs changed, because we now think the world is a riskier place than we did before we saw the financial crisis. And because we think the world is a riskier place, we invest less, we work less hard, and we produce less. Okay? So that's an example of putting in agents who don't know tail risk a simple way of getting them to update. This is much easier to do than Bayesian updating and captures some of that flavor. We're missing some things. What are we missing? These guys don't acknowledge they have parameter uncertainty. They're not computing distributions of parameters conditional on data. OK? 
Okay? But it's a really simple algorithm that you can put in the most, this is a very complicated DSGE model that you have to solve using collocation methods. It's a globally nonlinear model. You know, you can put a lot of whistles and bells in your model and still add learning to it if you do it this way, because this is a really simple piece to add on to any model that will get you endogenous persistence. So if we don't do learning, we still get a big shock. 08 and 09 are still really bad shocks that happen to the economy, but we recover. We're going to go back to steady state. We recover and we get a big boom in investment because if you wipe out a whole bunch of your capital stock, you want to invest a lot to rebuild it. Our guys don't want to invest a lot to rebuild it because they understand that now wiping out a whole bunch of the capital stock is possible. No, it probably underestimates because if I did Bayesian, what would happen is not only are they going to revise the parameters, but now they're going to say, but I really don't, I'm really uncertain about what the parameters are, right? This isn't a contraction mapping. I can get new information and have that standard deviation blow up. And there, there's a lot of nonlinearity in this model so that putting some more weight over here and more weight up there actually makes the, the outcome lower. Um, so my guess is, is that this is going to amplify it. But to be honest, I couldn't compute it. Yeah. So this model, you can actually compute the, the prices of the out of the money puts, right? I guess so, yeah. Yep. Yeah, we could, this is a framework. They are so much higher yeah. than the previous session. Yeah, so this is a framework that would be more suitable to doing, to doing asset pricing. I just, I, I don't want to wade in there just yet. I want to do the macro paper and then talk to the asset pricing literature with a separate set of facts, but yeah. Okay. So, uh, Basically, this is just showing if we did an exercise similar with shocks from 2001, 2002, they're like there in the distribution. They're not nearly so far out in the tails. So they change our probability distribution, but not that much. And so these kinds of shocks are generating a lot less persistence. They're smaller shocks, but they're also less persistent. Stuff that we've never seen before is really persistent. And part of that is because every time you get a new piece of data here, you kind of scale <coughs> down this distribution a little bit. And the more density was already there, the more you're scaling it down to make, to, like if you had 10 pieces of data and you got an 11th, you'd scale all this down by a 10th to add your new probability density. And what goes down the most, the highest pieces. Okay. So stuff that's out in the tails is going to get us a larger and more persistent change in beliefs. Okay, conclusions. Nobody knows the true distribution of shocks. I know we all write rational expectations models. I've done it too, but let's be honest. It's a, it's a farce, right? They're simplifying assumptions we make to make our models work. Nobody knows what the distribution of shocks is. So we should acknowledge that, not just because, well, you know, it's a more complex model and more, but it matters. New data permanently reshapes our assessment of macro risks. If we don't know what the true distribution is, when we see things we haven't seen before, it changes how we think about those kinds of events going forward. And especially tail risks, because unified theory of uncertainty, risk, micro risks, sentiment shocks, belief biases. A lot of these shocks that we've been talking about in macroeconomics can all be linked back to changes in assessment of tails, which themselves are very volatile because we don't have much data on them. And so it gives us a new source of fluctuations and a new persistence mechanism because not only does this thing move around a lot, but once it moves, it tends to stay high, right? Because that comes from the martingale property of beliefs, that when I change my belief, I don't tend to change it back tomorrow. If I believe that tail risk is high, chances are I'm going to believe tail risk is high tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that. So hopefully this gives us some new tools to attack problems in macro and finance. Great. Any more questions or comments? Well, I think Laura and every other speakers have been discussing okay. today this area of thoughts. And